Welcome back to the knowledge clips to the book Evidence-Based Human Resource Management, What Do We Know About People in Workplaces? And in this clip, I will continue talking about chapter two, and I will introduce two more theories, namely social capital theory and social exchange theory. If you add these to the theories on human capital that we discussed in the previous clip, you pretty well have the ingredients you need to make an HR business case. So after this clip, you understand literally the basics of social capital theory and social exchange theory. Let's start with social capital theory. So the big names in this field are Adler and Kwon, um, and they define social capital as the potential that is generated by the network, important word, of social relations in an organization, and that can be used to enable actions. So it is like the illustrations to the, le to the left of the slide uh, show. It's about all these people in organizations and their interconnections. Um, these interconnections are important for individuals in organizations. So if you want to perform your job and you need information, you need somebody else, but you need to know this other person. And this other person sh should be willing to share their knowledge about what you need. And you can add that to the team level. So Smoothly operating teams are a blessing for organizations. Their work will happen almost automatically without the need of much supervision. Also, imagine that an organization is embodied in a network of relationships with other organizations, and for example, with universities and government as well. So this network also happens on the, on the level of the organization. And if an organization is well positioned, has a central place in a network, then they can just be the ones that have access to the newest knowledge or uh, be an important partner, for example, in a tender for an important job. So in essence, the essence of social capital theory is about the relationships between people in organizations. This picture is famous. It's, uh, it's the Dublin headquarters of Google. And Google is known worldwide for their offices. They are fancy, and they want, of course, to be an attractive employer. So this is one of the things they use to, uh, to show who they are. It can also be understood from a social capital perspective. Because if you are an organization that is focused on innovations and uh, learning from each other, of course, you need a workplace that is designed in such a way that people will accidentally walk into each other, share coffee, share talk, and then exchange their knowledge. And also, there should be some kind of an atmosphere that, it's, that you can sit there and just sit back and relax and talk about things. Because it's a, the belief that in such a beehive structure, um, good things may happen. So this can be translated back to the social capital theory by Adler and Kwon. So according to Adler and Kwon, there are three dimensions of social capital. There is structural social capital, relational social capital, and cognitive social capital. Structural social capital is literally the design of the organization, the design of workplaces. Does the organization allow that people can walk to each other, can actually meet each other? If an organization is very strictly hierarchically organized, and people are just in their offices and they are supposed to be there from nine to five without going out, so to speak, then of course the opportunity to meet each other is really, really low. And then the structural social capital of that organization will accordingly also be low. Relational social capital has more to do with the quality of relationships between individuals or between, again, organizations. Imagine that uh, Two organizations have a contract in which they were doing things, so the structural side of the relationship is there. But then, they don't like each other. There's nothing that the one can do that the other really trusts. In such a relationship, the exchange of knowledge from one partner to the other becomes really, really difficult. So relational social capital has to do with the liking of each other. If there are close relationships, it's more likely that people actually like working together, and then it's more likely that that will happen. Finally, the cognitive social capital. This is the shared belief that working together and collaborations is a good thing. 
So, for example, an organization that promotes teamwork as the part of working in the organization, they have, uh, they bring to the employees a message that is actually a good thing, thing to team up. In science, for example, there is a debate uh, that we should move away from the old competitive, the professor is the one and only important person who should publish top, to something called team science, because we, uh, in science also there is a stronger and stronger belief that it's not one person who does excellent research, there's always a team behind them, and the team should, be, should feel valued and should feel that they are invited to you know, contribute to this, um, in this case, research. So, all three elements can be managed from a re human resource management perspective. So it's the design of offices and the, the structure of the organization. It is investing in that people like each other, maybe social outings, and it's investing in the way of working, how we should work in the organization. These are all elements that are parts that of human resource management where organizations can invest in. So is this important? Again, evidence-based. Yes, uh, we have a nice meet at Edison by Westland and Adam, 2010, and they researched the importance of uh, social capital on the level of individuals, teams, organizations, and societies even. So you can already summarize the findings. Social capital matters for each and every of these levels, and the effect sizes are quite impressive as well. For the individual, just to give a small example, it matters whether or not you know people if you're looking for a job. Eh? People with a higher social capital, so access to important people in their networks and also to have some quality relationships, they are more likely that they have are proposed to, to, uh, to a job. Yes, networking still matters. And the same is true for, uh, uh, for organizations. I already gave the example how important it is to have your external network as an organization because there will be opportunities that you may be missed out if you are not part of a certain uh, quality network of other organizations. So <clears throat> an interesting sidestep might be how to research social, social capital. And this is a figure that you will come across if you look into uh, social capital theory-based research. So it is about relationships between people. So all the dots in these figures, you can conceive them as uh, individuals or as teams, for example. And the lines indicate that these people work together. So there is a relationship or a contract or they like each other. The idea is that somebody's position in the network will determine how strong their social capital is, but also the, uh, the quality of the lines. And these are often indicated with the thicker or thinner lines. So if somebody is central in a network and there are a lot of thick lines going out to the other parts in the network, then that person is in a very advantaged position. So in that, for that person, the social capital is really strong and an important resource for their performance. So, in the context of people management, it is important to realize that all these relationships, they, are, they lie in the behavior of people. So, it's not automatically, if you, if you make sure that there is, you know, structural social capital, that people will automatically like each other. And the same is true for consortia of organizations who collaborate. All of these collaborations need investments and there need to be some investment in that. There's also a good quality relationship and this takes time and trust um, and it's not as easy. So the implications for human resource management obviously is that uh, encouraging teamwork in the broader sense of the word is beneficial for organizations. It is about individuals liking to work together. It is about departments being able to find each other. It is about organizations reaching out to their external networks as well. So human resource management can really contribute to creating conditions in which there is a shared understanding that teamwork is important, that they can work together, and so on. Why is this important? reach back to this uh, uh, resource-based view theory. Remember, um, the social organizational capital and the human capital, so also the knowledge about these networks, these are the elements, the resources that are 
difficult to copy, so non, uh, they are uh, non-transparent, as well as difficult to just move to another place, so they're also um, uh, non-transferable. So teamwork, social capital, an important element of uh, human resource management in the business case. The next theory, as promised, is, uh, is adding something to the, uh, to the idea of human capital. And I'm going to talk about motivation. Social exchange theory is the perspective that we can use to understand why people are motivated to put in just as little extra in their efforts to contribute to the organization. So, if so far we've talked about resources as more the, you know, the, the people working together, so uh, social organizational capital, as well as human capital being the, uh, uh, you know, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that, that, that nest in individuals. Here, in the last part of this chapter, I'll make a jump to motivation. And motivation, you can imagine, if people are willing to put a little extra effort, then organizations will perform better. A little extra investment in a relationship, a little bit extra investment in your work, better performance. Right. How does motivation work? There are loads of theories. I am going to touch upon the most cited theory, which is, which is social exchange theory. What is social exchange, exchange theory? It is a theory that explains why people put eff extra effort at work. And at the core of this theory is an exchange relationship. So in essence, any work relationship is uh, where employees work in an organization is an exchange between employees who put their precious time to the organization and they work there and they do so because they are something that they receive in return, because they have salary or because they are maybe learning opportunities or maybe they are very nice colleagues. In essence, an employment relationship is an exchange mechanism between an organization, employer, and an employee. So what happens in this relationship? That is central of, the, uh, of this theory. Uh, different from the other theories, there is not a single author that can be attributed as the core author to this theory. Actually, if you, uh, if you look into social exchange theory, there are three main contributors to, uh, to the building of the theory, and they are Homans, Goldner, and Blau. So what did they do? Um, the fundamentals of the theory. It all started with Homans, and Homans claimed that uh, any relationship between two individuals is based on an exchange relationship. So a relationship will continue as long as both partners find pleasure in this relationship so that there is something in it for them. He made a distinction between economic exchange relationships and social exchange rela relationships. In economic exchange relationships, the relationship is really short. There is, uh, for example, you go to, uh, you need something, you need something repaired, then uh, you call a, a plumber, and for, the, for, the, for a short moment, the two of you, you with your broken plum plumbing system and the plumber, you have a brief relationship, which is purely economic, because the moment your plumbing system is fixed, the relationship ends. It was based on a contract, there's a pay, and neither of you expects something extra from this relationship. You don't want this person to stay over for dinner or anything. It's just, it ends after the service is completed. Social exchange relationships, on the other hand, are more open-ended, and they are like friendships. They continue as long as both partners in the friendship find it valuable. Um, there is an element of economic thinking in there, according to Homans, because if the uh, relationship doesn't make you happy anymore, then it stops. The second one. The second contributor to the social exchange theory is Goldner. So he uh, wondered why some relationships continue, even if it's obvious that there is a disbalance between what is done. Um, and he introduced the norm of reciprocity. And reciprocity means that if I invest in this relationship, I expect that I will have some kind of return that is valuable for me. However, I don't need it immediately. I expect this return to come at some point. And I expect that the thing that is going to be my return is 
of equal value, at least in my mind, to what I invested in it. So if I put a lot of effort in something in the relationship, um, and uh, at some point, I do hope that it is equally paid back. Because according to Goldner and also Holmans earlier, they said that this relationship should be in balance. It also explains why individuals become frustrated if the return is not there or it is much smaller than you expected it to be. So you make a big fuss about, uh, uh, about a birthday and um, you hope that uh, some of your best friend may come. Um, because last time when uh, this person had their birth birthday, um, you brought a big gift. And then if this person doesn't show up, then there is a disbalance and uh, there is a feeling that there is, uh, it's unfair, the norm of reciprocity is damaged and the relationship will be harmed. So people will be angry or frustrated and seek for revenge. Okay. We dealt with Holmans, we dealt with Goldner, and they were all talking about relationships between individuals, one person to another. Then came Peter Blau, and he added uh, the, no the notice that people also can have relationships with non-persons, and non-persons being organizations. And then it becomes really interesting for human resource management because employees uh, have an exchange relationship with an employer, but this is not one person, this is an organization, this is a, an anonymous entity. But yet, the norm of reciprocity, the expectation that there will be a fair return, also exists in this relationship between an employee and this anonymous employer. So organizations, although they are not humans, they are assigned human-like characteristics by employees. And they also expect that if they put in a lot of effort to the organization that the organization will likewise return a good salary or at least some, uh, some compliments for you, from, from your supervisor. So according to social exchange theory, this exchange relationship should be in balance. So if the employer is good to employees, and especially if the employer is more or better to employees than the employee expected beforehand, this is a trigger to restore the imbalance in the relationship and the employees will feel compelled to be a very good employee and work a little bit harder. So a positive attitude, extra effort, these are the rewards that the organization re uh, receives in return for being a good employer to make sure that all the employment conditions are really, really nice, for example, or that the, lead, uh, uh, the supervisor is really nice. However, when the organization um, gives less as compared to what the employee expected, then the extra effort will reduce as well. So employees will make up in their behavior for the disbalance that they per perceive in the relationship with their employer. So this, mean, this means, translated, if an employer is good to their employees, employees will feel motivated, according to social exchange theory. If an employer uh, gives less, so just basically uh, a basic pay and nothing more, the employee will also feel less motivated to put extra effort in the job. So unleashing all the social and human capital can be realized by also investing in the social e exchange relationship between employers and employees. What are the ben benefits of having a, uh, a good social exchange relationship with your employees as an employer? Well, first of all, employees will feel happy, so that we, we have, it has been related to, to things like uh, job satisfaction, commitment, so feeling like you're part of, the, part of the family in the business and you want to really contribute. And it pays all off in what is really important, extra effort. Extra effort is the extra role behavior, so things that are not demanded based on the employment contract, but staying a little bit later to help out a colleague, or putting some extra effort to, to make sure that the client is really satisfied. So all the extra things that really make the difference for the organization, but are not really demanded by employees, these are extra role behaviors. 
And by taking good care of your employees, you will stimulate that they will feel an urge, the reciprocity to show this extra effort. Another word that you might come across in the literature is organization citizenship behavior. So this is literally a concept that captures all the non-contractual behaviors like taking initiative, helping uh, uh, each other, staying longer to finish the job without being, you know, without, without having to. All these nice things, are all the efforts of employees that matter for organizations and that bring about positive performance as a whole are nested in social exchange logics. Well, to the research then, does it pay off to, uh, to invest in, uh, in employees so to give them extra money as compared to the competitors or maybe to have very good uh, supervisors? And yes, the answer is yes. So if there is a higher than expected reward by the organization and reward should be understood in the broadest sense of the word, so flexible working conditions, uh, um, personal attention, there's all these things, not only the money, but all the non-tangible things as well. This will lead to additional job performance, a willingness to do something extra, so organization, citizenship behavior, and commitment. Chewy et al, 1997, nice paper. Uh, and similar, likewise, it's also demonstrated in longitudinal and meta uh, analysis that it is uh, an important mechanism that explains commitment, satisfaction, and in the end, better organizational performance, course 2001. So what's the implication for human resource management? Yeah, here we can be the Santa Claus. Make sure that your employees feel satisfied about the organization. Make sure that they feel part of the, part of the team. Make sure people feel included, have an eye for individual needs, and we'll come to talk about that in chapter five. Um, so basically, make sure that employees feel that they are seen as people and not just as commodities that are there to perform for the organization. And then the employees will return that with um, nice behaviors. So this brings me to the end of chapter two. Uh, we have discussed human capital, social capital, and social exchange theory, and we can place these three big theories within the context of Barney's research-based view. Because if an organization succeeds to hire or develop the best able human capital as compared to their comp competitors, in addition to having a group of employees that has excellent working relationships, not only in terms of structure, but also in terms of good quality relationships and uh, knowing that working together is important, and finally, an organization that takes good care of their employees, they will have a workforce that has a unique capability and they will have an excellent starting point to achieve competitive advantage and score high on all the organization performance indicators that we uh, introduced in the uh, clip on resource-based view. That's it for now. The, we discussed social capital theory, social exchange theory, how human and social capital bring about unique capabilities, how social exchange theory adds motivation as a resource, and which HR practices can improve human and social capital and social exchange. <laughs>